Hello everyone and welcome to the SFL webinar series. My name is Leah Paul Gashley and I am the director of the SFL webinar series and an executive board member of SFL. We are honored to have Professor Matt Zwolinski deliver a talk tonight on libertarianism and the left. Before we begin though, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Students for Liberty and the webinar series. Students for Liberty is a 501c3 nonprofit organization run by students and for students dedicated to liberty. We were formed three years ago to serve a previously unfilled niche in our universities, connecting liberty-friendly students with other students, faculty, organizations, and resources to help them advance their ideas and applications of classical liberalism. The resources we offer include free books for student groups, a speaker's network, protest grants, handbooks on running a student organization, tabling kits, leadership training, an academic journal for liberty and society, and our bread and butter conferences. The SFL webinar series is a way of giving you access and ideas and mentorship in Liberty year-round from wherever you are. We hold webinars each week to put you in touch with the top mentors and scholars for Liberty in the country. For a full list, please visit our website, studentsforliberty.org. Tonight's webinar is with, was with Professor Zwolinski. Professor Zwolinski specializes in political philosophy and normative ethics. He is the co-director of, of UCD's Institute for Law and Philosophy and serves on the editorial board of Business Ethics Quarterly. His areas of research expertise are political philosophy and normative ethics with a special focus on the intersection of ethics, law, and economics. Professor Zolinski received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Arizona and a BA in philosophy and a BS in political science from Santa Clara University. Just to note, there will be about 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A at the end of the webinar. Feel free to type in any questions into the question box. For those interested, this webinar will be recorded and archived on our website in the next few days. We will be sending you a more uh, follow-up email with more detailed information about Students for Liberty and our upcoming webinar in, the, um, in a follow-up email. Without further ado, I present to you Professor Zolinski. Hi. So uh, let me start off just by uh, thanking you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, Students for Liberty is, without a doubt, one of the most impressive and uh, amazing, I think, developments in the spread of libertarian ideas that I've witnessed over the course of my lifetime. The uh, level of organization, the depth of knowledge uh, among both the leaders and the, the general citizens in this uh, group, and the incredible passion that you all evidently have for those ideas. Um, is really nothing short of, of mind-boggling. So it's really an honor for me to be able to speak with you tonight about uh, ideas that we all care about. Um, so I'm here tonight because I think that libertarians have a rare opportunity. It's an opportunity that's exemplified almost perfectly, I think, by the Occupy Wall Street movement, which is a movement united, it seems to me, by a vague sense that there is something wrong with the political and economic organization of the United States. A vague sense of injustice, but no clear idea of how to articulate that injustice, the specific nature of the injustice, or the specific steps that ought to be taken to remedy the injustice. And what I want to suggest to you is that this discontent, this vaguely articulated sense that something is wrong, provides libertarians with an opportunity to engage in an act of positive self-transformation. That self-transformation is in part a rebranding, that is to say it is a change in the way that libertarianism is perceived by the outside. But it's more than merely a rebranding. It's also a way, I think, an opportunity for libertarians to change the way in which they see themselves. A transformation, I think, that goes deep to the moral and political beliefs that form the very foundation of libertarian doctrine. And a transformation, I think, that would, if affected, have a real impact on the way in which libertarians see the world around them, on the way in which we understand the workings of our current political and economic order, who it hurts, who it benefits, what its purposes are, 
And on the way, we see ourselves moving forward. What our inspirational vision of the Just Society is, what our policy goals should be in moving forward, and what the relative importance of different policy goals should be, and on who our natural allies are in pursuing those policy transformations. The essence of this self-transformation that I want to encourage you to undertake tonight involves more than just reaching out to the political left. So I think that's an important part of the transformation. I think libertarians need to do more to reach out to the political left. But more than that, more radically than that, I think it involves a reconceptualization of libertarianism as part of the political left. Libertarians have a radical and liberal intellectual heritage and I think it is time for libertarians to embrace that heritage, to end their marriage of convenience with conservatism, and to reclaim their identity as a form of radical liberalism, indeed the most consistent and thoroughgoingly radical form of liberalism. Now, in a way, if we focus on what libertarians say, we focus on the language that they use, the way they talk about themselves and what they're doing. They already do this, um, I'm sure. So all of you are familiar with this. You've seen this before, this Nolan chart. And what this Nolan chart does, self-evidently, is set up libertarianism as an alternative to both the political left and the political right. right? Libertarians represent themselves in this chart and elsewhere as a genuine alternative, a third option that's neither left-wing nor right-wing but consistently pro-liberty in a way that the traditional left-right spectrum does not and cannot recognize. But I think that if you look at what libertarians do and have done rather than what they say and have said, you get a very different picture of libertarianism. I think ever since the 1930s, at least in the United States, libertarianism has been associated with political right. And really, it was only since the 1930s that libertarianism as a self-conscious political movement existed in the United States. Prior to the 1930s, you had people who we would now retrospectively identify as libertarians. But libertarianism as a self-conscious political movement is really a post-war phenomenon, so something that didn't actually fully develop until the 1940s and beyond. But you begin to see the key of this movement, I think, in the 1930s. And the driving force, the major impetus to the beginnings of that movement was, I think, the New Deal. What brought libertarians together was not any set of common philosophical principles, not any common set of moral beliefs or religious beliefs or cultural beliefs. What brought libertarians together for the first time, I think, was opposition to something. They saw something they didn't like, and they knew that they didn't want that, whatever else they wanted. Whatever their disagreements might be about more fundamental metaphysical issues, or even about more fundamental economic and political issues, the people who we now identify as libertarians saw themselves as opposed to the infringements on liberty involved in FDR's New Deal. And so you saw bedfellows being made of some otherwise very disparate characters. Russian atheists like Ayn Rand, religious believers like Isabel Patterson, and men of the left like Albert J. Nock and H. L. Mencken. So began, I think, the seeds of libertarianism as a self-conscious political movement, but it really took off again in the 1940s in the post-war era. And again, the impetus was not a commonality of beliefs, a commonality of what we were for, but rather a commonality of what we were against. And what we were against was international communism. There were a number of libertarians who saw in international communism the greatest threat to individual liberty that the world had ever witnessed. Prior to the 1940s, of course, people had identified socialism as a threat to individual liberty. We saw this very clearly, for instance, in the writings of Herbert Spencer in the late 19th century. But international communism seemed posed to take the abstract threat of socialism and make it into a very real reality for a large portion of the world's population. And people thought that, perhaps not unreasonably, that 
was the most important thing for them to oppose, and that if opposing it meant making common political cause with people with whom you had very serious moral and political disagreements, well then, so be it. So those two sources, I think, are uh, two of the most important points uh, in, the, in the origins of libertarianism as a self-conscious political movement in the United States. And they, I think, played an important and almost impossible to overstate role in shaping the nature of libertarianism, not just in the middle of the 20th century, but up to and continuing today. Uh, so for a bit of evidence, um, let me direct you to uh, a poll that was conducted by Liberty Magazine, uh, which is a magazine that some of you might not be familiar with uh, anymore. It used to be the journal of uh, libertarian thought um, for libertarians, whereas Reason Magazine was sort of the outreach magazine sort of selling libertarianism to the world. Liberty Magazine was the way in which libertarians communicated to each other during the 1980s, during the 1990s, before we had the blogosphere and uh, lots of other ways of libertarians sharing ideas amongst each other. Liberty Magazine was it. And, uh, and Liberty Magazine did, did uh, an interesting thing. They conducted a poll of their readers uh, three times, once in 1988, once in 1998, and then again in 2008. Uh, and in that poll, they asked their readers a number of questions uh, about their moral, economic, political, cultural beliefs, um, demographic information. And uh, these polls are just fascinating, really. They provide a really interesting glimpse into the makeup of the libertarian movement and into the ways in which that movement has changed uh, over the last three decades. But uh, the question that's particularly telling for our purposes has to do with uh, political self-identification in particular. Liberty Magazine asked its readers how they self-identified politically prior to coming to libertarianism. Uh, and the answer is pretty striking. So in 1988, when they asked this question, a full 65% of respondents identified as coming from the political right whereas only 20% identified as coming from the political left. So it's quite a shocking disparity. Now that's um, softened a bit over time. So if you look at the 2008 poll, you see that the uh, number uh, coming from the identifying as coming from the political right is down to 52%. Um, but the number identified as coming from the political left is, is only up very slightly uh, to 22%. Um, so what we see here, the image this paints, is still uh, a libertarianism as a, um, as a right-wing movement or a movement that at least has its origins or appeal in the right wing of the political spectrum. Um, now, that's, that's a, a data source that one might quibble with, I suppose. Um, as I said, Liberty Magazine was the journal of the, the sort of inside journal of libertarianism, um, and so it appealed to people who you would probably identify as hardcore libertarian. Uh, perhaps if you look at the broader libertarian movement, you would get different information. And uh, to some extent, you do. So uh, Nick Gillespie and uh, Matt Welch, in their new book, The Declaration of Independence, look at some data about um, libertarians who self-identify libertarians more broadly. And I think they find less of an affiliation with the political right there. But there's still a significantly more affiliation with the political right than with the uh, political left. So you find some evidence there in the way that libertarians identify themselves. Uh, I think you also, of course, find some evidence in the way that people outside the libertarian movement identify libertarians. So uh, I'm sure we've all seen this phenomenon where um, libertarian individuals or libertarian think tanks, especially like the Cato Institute, are identified by uh, the news media as a as conservative think tanks or as right-wing think tanks. Of mine, and I'm sure of even many of yours. Um, but while it's annoying, it's I think not entirely ununderstandable uh, to use an awkward uh, phrase. Um, it's a mistake, of course, I think, to identify Cato as a as a right wing doctrine. But again, I think if you look at the kinds of things that libertarians say, if you look at the rhetoric they use, and if you look at what they emphasize. I think there's a certain picture of libertarianism that emerges that's different from the picture that you get if you engage in sort of a serious study of all the things that libertarians have written or said. Uh, if you look at just the sort of highlight reel of libertarians, it is not entirely unreasonable, I think, 
come away with the impression that libertarianism is more of a right-wing doctrine than a left-wing doctrine. So, for instance, I think if you look at the kind of things that libertarians in America have said over the last 80 years, libertarians have spent far too much time talking about the way in which government hurts business and the way in which government attempts to help the poor are misguided or immoral. Far too much time talking about those things and not nearly enough time talking about the way in which government tries to help business or the way in which government hurts the poor through a variety of programs. I think libertarians spend far too much time talking about the idea that an increase in the marginal tax rate is a kind of slavery of the wealthy and not nearly enough time talking about the way in which the draft or the war on drugs, restrictions on workers' rights of association, are a real infringement of the liberty of the poor. I think libertarians have been far too willing to lionize politicians on the right who have mastered the rhetoric of liberty. In mind here people like Ronald Reagan, but I think the same thing is true of most of the Republican candidates for president today. If you watch any of the presidential primaries and have the stomach to sit through this, you see people who talk the language of liberty, but at the same time, if you look at what their actions and sometimes and what they say, they're all too willing to vastly increase the size and power of the state, especially the most lethal and despotic elements of the state, the police and military. So I think libertarians have spent far too much time on these issues that appeal to the political right, not nearly enough time on issues that are consistent with libertarian principles, but that would appeal more to those on the political left. There are exceptions, of course, and I'll, I'll talk about some of those exceptions shortly. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure I'm exaggerating a little bit here to make a point. But the point is this. If libertarians are dissatisfied with the public perception and reputation of libertarianism, then I think they have at least partially their own selves to blame. It is, I think, difficult to complain about a reputation for loose virtue when you've spent the last 80 years promiscuously hopping into the sack with various figures on the political right. But, okay, so the main message I want to communicate here is, is not a critical one, it's a hopeful one. Um, the message is this, it's that uh, libertarians, although they might be identified today as mostly a fringe movement of the right wing, uh, things weren't always that way in the past, and they do not have to be that way in the future. I think if we look to the past, many key figures in the libertarian intellectual tradition uh, self-identified as left-wing liberals. And so let me name for you just a few. Um, Claude Frédéric Bastiat, famous economist and propagandist for laissez affairs of early 19th century France, uh, was for a short while a member of the French Legislative Assembly, and he sat in the Assembly, importantly, on the left side, um, which indicated his support for the radical left wing uh, political movements of the time. He sat alongside people like the socialist anarchist Pierre Joseph Proudhon uh, and opposed to those conservatives on the right who supported the dethroned monarchy and the aristocracy. People like Thomas Hodgkin who not enough libertarians know about, um, decried the exploitation of workers under capitalism, by which he meant not really laissez-faire capitalism, but the kind of corporatist, interventionist excuse for capitalism that existed in, in uh, England at the time. Uh, he was also a, 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 a strong and vocal and passionate opponent of despotic military power. Uh, his essay on naval discipline is, is well worth reading uh, as an introduction to his thought. People like H.L. Mencken and Albert J. Knox, two individuals I think who are now regarded today as uh, vanguards, early vanguards of libertarianism in the 20th century America. Uh, these two individuals were at least originally seen, and I think to some degree saw themselves as men of the left during the 1920s. Um, and then of course there's Benjamin Tucker, who was a self-identified socialist. Um, and this is true, I think, of, of many um, of his comrades in the American anarchist movement more generally. 
uh, many of the people with whom he collaborated with his Liberty magazine. Um, I think it was a really fascinating overview of Tucker and uh, the American anarchist movement uh, in a book by James Martin called Men Against the State. Great book, um, full of lots of interesting intellectual history and some terrific anecdotes. And, and it's very, uh, like so many other great things, you can get it for free from the uh, Ludwig von Mises Institute as a, as a PDF. So Tucker is another example, uh, but of course the example with which you're probably all most familiar and, and the example has probably played the most important role in the shaping of libertarianism in the 20th century is uh, Rothbard. So Rothbard, um, especially during the 1960s, um, when you're talking about Rothbard, you sort of have to specify Rothbard circa 1960 or 1980 or 1990 because you get very different views uh, depending on which time slice of Rothbard you're talking about. But Rothbard, at least circa 1965 or so, um, edited a journal called Left and Right, a journal of libertarian thought. And the inaugural issue of that journal contained an essay by Rothbard, which is still very, very much worth reading. And uh, which, again, is easily accessible for free online through the Ludwig von Mises Institute. The title of that essay is Left and Right, the Prospects for Liberty. And its thesis is that it is both a historical and a philosophical mistake to see libertarianism as an ally of conservatism and an enemy of socialism. So historically, Rothbard argued, libertarianism has its origins in Western Europe as a form of liberalism. And liberalism, Rothbard argued, was an ideology of hope, of radicalism, of liberty, of the industrial revolution, of progress, and of humanity, an ideology that aligned itself against the conservative ideology of reaction, hierarchy, statism, theocracy, serfdom, and class exploitation of the old order. The main enemy of liberalism was not socialism. The main enemy of liberalism was conservatism. Now over time, Rothbard argues, liberalism lost its radical edge originated as a radical doctrine, but it lost that radical edge, in part because of its embrace of, in, in Rothbard's view, uh, a utilitarian ethics as opposed to a more radical, and in Rothbard's eyes, sounder natural law view, um, and of a kind of gradual evolutionism. Um, and socialism, Rothbard thinks, emerged to fill the void left by liberalism's moderation. But it too failed, uh, and ended up, as Rothbard's view, as a kind of middle of the road ideological movement. And the reason, the reason that, uh, that socialism failed is that while it sought to achieve liberal ends, the same ends that liberals were aiming at, it sought to achieve those ends by conservative means. This is a quote from Rothbard. Socialism, like liberalism and against conservatism, accepted the industrial system and the liberal goals of freedom, reason, mobility, progress, higher living standards for the masses, and an end to theocracy and war. But it tried to achieve those ends by the use of incompatible conservative means, statism, central planning, communitarianism, etc. So socialists and libertarians on Rothbard's views are united against conservatism. Conservatism and liberalism aren't opposite ends of the political spectrum. Liberalism and conservatism are opposite ends of the political spectrum. Socialism is this confused middle of the road ground that seeks to, see, uh, to achieve liberal ends by conservative means. Liberals oppose conservatism and the society of status, stagnation, and hierarchy that it represents. Where the socialists and the libertarians disagree, Rothbard suggests, is primarily on the question of what means would be the most effective in achieving these liberal ends, and these shared liberal ends of liberty, progress, and the like. Okay, so I think Rothbard is probably overstating the case here. Right? It's true, I think, that many disagreements between socialists and liberals are empirical. They're about means, not about ends. They're about how to effectively achieve the goals that we share in common, not about the goals themselves. Um, this, for instance, is a bit of a theme that we've taken up on the Leading Heart Libertarians blog, right? I mean, the idea is that it's not um, as though libertarians oppose helping the poor, 
Uh, it's simply that libertarians in general believe that free markets and limited government are a better way of helping the poor than a robust welfare state or a socialist um, state in which the means of production are held by the public at large. Um, but I think a lot of the disagreements are about means, but some of the disagreements are about ends, too, uh, especially how to prioritize and emphasize competing values. So what I want to do with the remainder of my time here is to suggest some ways in which these remaining disagreements uh, might be narrow, these remaining empirical, methodological, and philosophical disagreements that do separate the contemporary left from contemporary libertarianism. Um, some of this narrowing, some of the ways in which the gap between these two views can be narrowed, I think, involves the left learning or taking on board insights from libertarianism, but not all of it. I think if there's going to be a genuine narrowing of the gap between libertarianism and the left, the learning is going to have to go in both directions. And libertarians are, in fact, going to have to learn some lessons from the left. Um, but let me start with what the left should learn from libertarianism. The most obvious one, and the one suggested by the Occupy Wall Street movement, of course, is an opposition to corporatism. Um, libertarians are consistent opponents of government intervention in the economy. And that means that governments shouldn't place undue restrictions on business by, for instance, zoning laws, licensing requirements, such as taxation, and so on. But it also means that governments shouldn't help businesses through, well, licensing laws, zoning restrictions, uh, subsidies, protective tariffs, and the like. Uh, and we libertarians, I think, so that's a, that's a shared view, I think, between libertarians and elements on the left, but we libertarians are in an especially good position to articulate the case against corporatism, to explain why it is that corporatism arises, right, um, by drawing on the insights of, for instance, the public choice school of economics, right, to explain the phenomenon of rent seeking, and to explain why certain fixes that might be a, suggested to the corporatist problem aren't going to be sufficient, right? We can't solve the collusion that exists between government and business simply by passing a better campaign finance law or simply by getting people with better moral character in office, right? The problems are structural, and the problems require a structural solution that goes beyond anything that those on the left have suggested. So that's something, that's one thing I think that the left could stand to learn from the right. Another thing I think that the left could take the stand to learn from the right is to take coercion seriously. Uh, I mean, it's not as though people on the left like coercion. Uh, they dislike it. Uh, they dislike it when it occurs um, in the military draft. Uh, they dislike coercion when it's used, for instance, to impose uh, censorship. Uh, they dislike the coercive imposition of uh, religious views on uh, on non-believers. Um, it's just that they don't see coercion as a factor in economic regulation. They don't see it as a factor in restrictions on property rights. So I think the role that libertarians can play here, or what libertarians can teach those on the left, is that, co in a sense, coercion is coercion. And the reasons that we have to oppose coercion in the civil sphere are equally valid in the economic sphere. Liber those on the left already don't like coercion. The challenge that libertarians face, I think, is convincing them to take that commitment and apply it more consistently across the political sphere, not just in the area of so-called civil rights, but also in the area of economic rights. Uh, and I think you know, people like the Institute for Justice, who show the real effects that economic coercion has on the poor and vulnerable, are doing a wonderful and important job in making that case. Um, let me move a little quickly here because I don't want to run out of time. But um, I think you know those on the left, there's a long tradition on the left of a preference for small, voluntary, autonomous organization and a, and a tradition of opposition to centralized hierarchical authority. That, that tradition has been buried somewhat in the 20th century, I think, by the rise of state socialism. Um, but it's there, uh, and I think you know, those on the left are in a position to appreciate insights about spontaneous order, 
and libertarians have a rare opportunity, I think, to teach uh, those on the left about how spontaneous order works, how to foster it, how it manifests itself in the economic realm. Uh, again, to show that this is not something that is um, important merely in civil affairs, but also important in larger, more difficult to perceive economic affairs. And of course, I think there's a lot of policy issues, a lot of particular policy issues on which there's a kind of natural connection between the left and libertarianism, uh, things like drug policy, things like immigration restrictions. And, and, and I think not just they're an important um, point of connection between liberals and libertarians on these issues, um, but I think if you, if you look at the issues where there is this overlap, if you look at things like drug policy or immigration restrictions, those policies make a much bigger difference in the quantity and quality of freedom in America than a lot of the issues about which those on the left and libertarians disagree. Right? So those on the left and libertarians might disagree about you know, where the tax rate should be or whether we should abolish the uh, Department of uh, Education, of Commerce, of uh, Sorry, that was cheap joke. Um, <laughs> but I think, right, and those things make a difference to liberty. But I think, gosh, if you look at the way in which ordinary people's lives, especially the lives of the vulnerable and the poor, are affected by the state, immigration law would make a much, much bigger positive difference in those people's federal regulation. Um, and so, network cooperation. Okay. So, on all these issues, I think there's an underlying commonality between liberals and libertarians, and uh, and we can exploit this. I think, to our advantage. Um, but like I said, I think the learning is not going to go in all in one direction. Uh, I think there are some important philosophical and methodological points that libertarians can and should take from those on the left. So let me conclude my talk by um, discussing some of those. And let me start with the issue of non-governmental power and oppression. The libertarians think and write passionately about the oppression that occurs when governments overreach their proper bounds and the way in which governmental power is an important threat to individual liberty. But I think libertarians have done a much poorer job of recognizing other sources of oppression and other threats to liberty outside of the government. So I think in general, libertarians have done a poor job in taking seriously the way in which institutionalized racism and institutionalized sexism have limited the liberty of a significant portion of the world's population just as much as governmental power. And I think it would be naive to think that these phenomena would disappear altogether in a free market. Of course, racism and sexism have both been fostered as much by governments as they've been hindered by them. But even in the absence of government force, I think, these phenomena would be a problem. And I think it would be a mistake to suppose that libertarians would have no reason to oppose these phenomena, no reason to fight against them, if they weren't backed by state force. So what I have in mind here the idea I have in mind here is something I think is expressed very well uh, in an essay by Charles Johnson. Uh, it's a great essay. You can find it on the web uh, called Libertarianism Through Thick and Thin. Um, there's a short version of the essay published in the Freeman and then has a longer version of the essay published on his website, radgeek.com. Um, read the longer version. It's now reprinted in a uh, really excellent anthology uh, called Markets Not Capitalism, edited by Johnson and uh, Gary Chartier. And um, what he argues in this in this essay is that um, you know we ought to be thick libertarians, not thin libertarians, more like you understand what that means, but one of the ideas he puts forward is this idea of thickness in grounds, which means that look, libertarians are opposed to aggression, we're opposed to the use of, of force. But why? Or well, what are the reasons we have to be opposed to the use of force? Is it because it sets back individual autonomy? Is it because it um, produces bad consequences in some kind of utilitarian sense. Johnson argues that whatever reasons we have to oppose the use of force are also going to be good reasons to oppose other kinds of things that also limit autonomy or that also produce these systematic bad consequences. 
uh, for individuals' uh, lives and welfare. Um, and so we're going to have reasons as libertarians in a way, not just not just to be libertarians, but also to be opponents of these other non-governmental sources of oppression like racism, sexism, uh, and the like. Um, so that's that's one thing I think that those on the on the right, uh, you know, these political libertarians, can learn from those on the left is that um, yeah, government oppression is bad, but it's it's not the only kind of oppression that's bad. Uh, social justice. I've talked a fair bit about this. On the uh, on, on my blog, so I'm not going to belabor the point here. But uh, suffice to say, I think that libertarians should take on board from the left the belief that how the poor and vulnerable fare in a society matters for the moral evaluation of that society, for for our decision of whether that society is a just one or not. So I think, um, look, if you if you look at the way in which libertarians talk about their view, look, look at the way in which libertarians try to sell their view to those on the outside, we're always talking about the great consequences that would follow from the adoption of libertarian principles, right, and the way in which libertarian institutions would serve the interests of the poor. So one of two things is possible then, right? Either that's all just kind of rhetorical fluff. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's great that libertarianism would serve the interests of the poor, but that's not why libertarianism is just. It's just because it protects inviolable natural rights. This other stuff is just gravy. That's one possible view. I don't think that's very plausible. I think the more plausible view is that that matters. That if it wasn't true that libertarianism really did serve the interests of the poor, right? That if the critics of libertarianism were right, that libertarianism and free markets tended to increase the exploitation and alienation of the poor, that it made the rich get richer and the poor get poor. If all that stuff was true. I think we have good reason to question the moral justification of libertarianism. So I think if you believe that, if you take that view seriously then you really have to have some view um, that I think could accurately be described as a view of social justice. Um, so libertarians, I think, need to stop being afraid of that word and take on board the concern of those on the political left for issues of social justice. Historical injustice, right? So what do libertarians need to learn from the left? One thing they need to learn is that um, it's not as though the world we've got today has been arrived at by a peaceful process of labor mixing and voluntary exchange, right? That that's why there is inequality in the United States, because some people are smarter and better or luckier even than others. Um, with in fact, right, most land has been seized by violence rather than peaceful labor. Uh, even today, of course, the government continues to intervene forcefully on behalf of the powerful and against the marginalized. So given all that, right, given this massive historical and ongoing injustice, uh, I think we have to ask ourselves the question, right, would it really be fair to institute libertarian policies starting now? Or do we owe something to those who have been harmed by historical justice to compensate them for what they've suffered? And if so, what do we owe them? Right? I mean, imagine we're on a desert island, right? And uh, I sort of like club you over the head and I take your coconuts from you. And then I say, okay, starting now, Let's have absolute respect for property rights. That wouldn't be fair. Um, there would be an injustice there. And I think uh, the situation we face today is much the same. So um, when the people on the left point to the unjust origins of property rights as they currently exist, um, I think we libertarians need to take that seriously. Contact matter, very briefly, let me just say it here. I think, um, you know, people on the left in a way, tend to be less ideologically motivated than libertarians. Libertarians, there's a tendency, I think, for libertarians to think that we can solve complex uh, political, economic problems simply by kind of whipping out this prepackaged ideology to 
political strategist. So um, what I want to do in this point is to, in this talk rather, is to point out that there are good philosophical and historical grounds for a uh, for seeing libertarianism as a, as a radical left wing movement, uh, one that that has um, strong affinities with uh, the political left as it exists today. Um, can that common philosophical ground be translated into a kind of political alliance? I don't know. Um, it's been tried before. Right? We've had a history in the United States of attempts at forming a left libertarian alliance, and every single one of them has uh, failed. Right, So uh, you have, for instance, Rothbard in the 1960s, uh, followed by, uh, by Carl Hess. You know, they made some good strides, but eventually uh, the alliance collapsed. Um, you had Samuel Conkin's uh, Eggerth movement. Um, more recently, you had um, you know the kind of liberal pairing phenomenon um, spearheaded by by Will Wilson and Brent Lindsay, two former uh, employees of the Cato Institute who are of course no longer uh, employees of the Cato Institute for reasons that were never quite made fully clear. Um, so it'd be an interesting project, I think, for somebody other than me to go back through these movements and try to see why. Why did they fail? Um, what went wrong? Why didn't this uh, persist? And, and why, you know, was the left unreceptive? If so, for what reason? Um, I think, you know, the conclusion I can reach is that the past hundred years hasn't exactly offered reasons for optimism about the possibility of a left libertarian alliance. But of course, a hundred years is a relatively small chunk of time in the grand uh, scale of intellectual history. So it's possible to change the jump and could come fast, but the ongoing right now. Um, it's possible, I think, that the era of corporatist dominance is uh, coming to an end, that the uh, welfare warfare state that we see around us today is beginning to crumble under its own weight, that the uh, public dissatisfaction and sense of injustice at a system that uses the force of the state to benefit a privileged minority at the expense of a dispossessed masses is beginning to reach turning a boiling point. Uh, it's possible that uh, the libertarian movement in both its numbers and its understanding of philosophical, economic, and moral ideas is reaching a period of ascendancy such that it's going to make a real difference in our political world. But I think that if libertarians are going to make any progress in this movement, if they're going to take advantage of the opportunity that history may be handing them, they need to stop clinging to the legs of their big brothers on the political right and stand up on their own and to embrace their radical liberal heritage and to proclaim themselves as brothers and sisters of those on the left who condemn the artificially imposed hierarchy, privilege, and injustice of the contemporary corporatist and illiberal states. Thank you very much. So I think we have uh, time for some Q&A. Thank you so much, Professor. Yep, thank you so much. Um, to all our participants, please feel free to type in the questions in the question box that should be to your right. Um, our first question asks, why align ourselves with the left when we already have, as you pointed out, an alignment problem? Why not focus our efforts on distinguishing ourselves from both wings? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think we should not shy away from pointing out where we differ from those on the political left, um, and that we should not shy away from criticizing the left when they get it wrong. Um, so I don't disagree with that, uh, but I also think that we shouldn't shy away from embracing commonalities when and where they exist. And I think um, I think that the problem with our alliance to the right is that it's been a kind of exclusive alliance, right? Um, and that uh, that we that our commitment to the right has blinded us in a way um, to the failures of the political right 
and to uh, the strengths and commonalities that we have with the political left. So uh, uh, perhaps I'm, I'm advocating not so much for a uh, monogamous relationship with the political left, but a kind of uh, libertarian polyamory, uh, as it were, where we should uh, sort of not just hop into bed with the political right, but hop into the bed with the uh, political left too when it suits us. Um, I think uh, right, there's, there's some important there's some important issues on which libertarians have common cause with the political left. There's some important ways in which libertarianism is itself a left wing doctrine, and I think um, we should emphasize that moving forward. Okay, great. Our next question. Uh, to ally with the left, should libertarians borrow a tool from their kit and prioritize direct action or alternative institution building or social entrepreneurship over activ activism, pamphleting, think tanking, etc.? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And again, it's one of those issues that um, you know, sort of calls for a, a political strategist rather than a political philosopher. Um, my own view on strategy, uh, as, as sort of ill thought out as it is, is um, kind of a, a, a let a thousand flowers bloom approach. I mean, I think there are some people who are good at think tanky stuff. Uh, there are some people who are good at writing for academic journals. Uh, and there are some people who are good at um, sort of straightforward political activism, right? Um, and I think, uh, you know, do what you're good at. Uh, I think uh, there's room and there's a, there's a need for people who are really skilled at political advocacy, advocacy uh, and activism in the libertarian movement. I think libertarianism has been historically, at least again in the United States, a kind of intellectual heavy movement, right? I mean, so there's been, there's been a lot of people who are good at the intellectual stuff and not so many people who are good at or have a passion for uh, the more direct activism stuff. And I think that's a shame. I think that's weakened the libertarian movement. Um, you know, I think I think libertarians, we need our own like puppeteers, right? I mean, people on the left at their protests, they always have these like big you know, mannequins and puppets and art shows and things like that. Uh, and I think, you know, there's something kind of cool about that. And, uh, and I think libertarians would reach out to a broader audience if we could do stuff like that too. Uh, I was just at a conference in San Diego, it's a, it's a Libertopia conference, the second year they've had it now. And you know, I actually did see some of that um, from libertarians, which was good, which was heartening. I mean, it's not my bag, it's not my cup of tea, but um, but I'm glad that other people are doing that. And I think, you know, the more the more diverse a set of skills that we bring to uh, the spread of libertarian ideas, the, the more successful that's going to be. Okay, our next question asks if you have any advice on the marketing. Um, should we call ourselves libertarian? Should we say classical liberal, voluntarist, etc.? Right. Um, you know, as far as as far as marketing goes, I'm not sure I do have much advice. Um, you know, I I tend to agree. I think with with Friedrich Hayek in his essay on why I'm not a conservative that uh, essentially uh, all the labels that people who we might call libertarians have suggested. Um, Bad. It's just not. They're not very compelling names. Um, I, of course, you know Hayek makes this point. He says, "I don't like the term libertarian." And then, you know, what does he suggest in its stead? Uh, old Whig, right? Um, that uh, I'm not sure is much of an improvement. Uh, in fact, I, I certainly recommend against calling yourself a Whig uh, if you're trying to win uh, political converts. Um, but you know, I, I think it's a philosophical matter. There's some. There are some substantive differences that are reflected in these terms, right? So, I mean, I think there's a difference between uh, a classical liberal and a libertarian um, in terms of the kinds of policies that they advocate, in terms of the kind of moral principles that they characteristically employ. Um, you know, so when I when I use the term classical liberal, uh, I have in mind people like Friedrich Hayek, people like Richard Epstein, people like you know Adam Smith um, or uh, or Milton Friedman even. Uh, people who don't sort of draw a bright line at the minimal state, right, and say, you know, police, courts, and military, that's it. That's all that a, a state can legitimately do. All the people I mentioned um, were, at least in some moments, supportive of a somewhat broader role for the state in providing public goods, 
um, or engaging in certain forms of redistribution and providing a kind of social safety net. Um, you know, when I think libertarian, sometimes I use the term libertarian in a kind of broad sense to include everybody, like classical liberals, minimal state libertarians like Robert Nozick and Ayn Rand, uh, and anarcho-capitalists like uh, Murray Rothbard or uh, Gustavo de Molinari. Um, but I think there are some important substantive differences there that at least when we're talking amongst each other, each other or when we're talking you know, in, a, in a kind of sophisticated format uh, where we, we really want to get clear on the distinction between different sorts of ideas, it's important to keep in mind that those words mean different things. But as far as you know, which word is going gonna, is gonna to win us converts and uh, you know, finally pushes over the edge, uh, I'm afraid I, uh, I don't know. You Students for Liberty folks seem to be uh, much more savvy about the, the marketing type issues than, uh, than certainly I am. <laughs> okay, the next question says, I agree about the right wing rhetoric affiliations. I am wondering if we might hope to see a larger view of libertarianism other than measuring how much the government intervenes in an economy. For example, in combating corporate personhood, a contradiction to classical liberalism, and externalities produced by corporate activities. Yeah, uh, I think that's right, too. Um, now, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I've, I've um, got the idea that the, the questioner is putting forward, but if I do, um, it sounds to me very similar to the line that Charles Johnson put forward in that uh, in that essay I mentioned, the uh, libertarianism is thick and thin, right? So the, the, maybe I'll take this opportunity to elaborate a bit upon that, the, the thesis of that essay. So, so Johnson says, right, there's a kind of thin libertarianism where, where all libertarianism is about is a certain view of the state, right? How big the state should be and how much the state should be involved in the economy or in our bedrooms or, or wherever. Um, that's a kind of thin view of libertarianism where it involved, it's thin in that it involves just a commitment to some certain narrow political questions and nothing else. You can be a libertarian and have whatever cultural or moral views you want as long as you toe the party line in, uh, on the political stuff. Johnson thinks that that view is not as attractive as a thicker version of libertarianism where um, you know, what it means to be a libertarianism Sorry, what it means to be a libertarian is not just to have a certain view about the size and scope of the state, but to have a more robust set of cultural and moral uh, beliefs, right? So, um, you know, for instance, somebody who's a, a libertarian in a thick sense is going to despise censorship, not merely when it is practiced by the, uh, the government through coercion, uh, but also when it's practiced by um, sort of purely, certain, at least certain kinds of purely voluntary organizations, right? So, um, you know, for instance, I think, you know, when I, when I see universities engaging in censorship, when I see them sort of set, setting up a free speech zone uh, as, you know, tiny little areas on the campus where people are allowed to actually, you know, express ideas, um, I think that's kind of repugnant. I think that that kind of activity goes against some of my core moral and political values, even though they don't really involve politics. It's a, I work at a private university, uh, so there's really not much political involvement at all. But still, I mean, you know, the reason I think government censorship is bad is in many ways um, the same reason I think that private censorship is bad. So my libertarianism, as I understand it, is a thick one. It, it's, a, it's one that provides me with reasons that reach certain conclusions, not merely about the size and scope of government, but also about sort of um, you know sort of moral cultural practice more generally. Um, so so I, I take it that I'm I'm agreeing with the uh, the questioner's point. I think it's an important one. Okay, uh, our next question: What are your thoughts on Nozick's entitlement theory of justice, which has the tagline "From each as they choose to each as they are chosen"? Uh, as, it is. as far as mottos go, that's a pretty good motto. Um, you know, what, what do I think of Nozick's entitlement theory? It's uh, that's a big question. Uh, I think Nozick's a great political philosopher. He's a, 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 just a brilliant philosopher in general, uh, political or otherwise. Uh, and Anarchy, State, and Utopia is a, a monumental work in political philosophy and in libertarian thought. Um, it's not the alpha and omega of libertarian thought, and I think 
there's an unfortunate tendency, at least within academic philosophy, to treat Nozick's theory as though it were sort of the beginning and the end of libertarianism, right, the last and the first word. Um, right? If you look at political philosophy anthologies, for instance, or if you look at the way political philosophy courses are taught, um, you know, there's a section on libertarianism, and what you find there every single time is Nozick and nothing else. Right? And so academic philosophers, there's a tendency among academic philosophers, and I think this is changing somewhat, to think that if you can show that, liber that Nozick's arguments about libertarianism are flawed, then you can show that libertarianism is flawed, because after all, Nozick is the kind of epitome of libertarianism. Um, like I said, that's changing. I think high fees are getting a little bit more attention now, and um, you get a bit more attention paid to sort of consequentialist approaches to libertarianism, like you find in say, Richard Epstein. Um, but uh, so there's, there's a sense in which I think Nozick's view is o overrated. Um, there's a sense in which uh, it, it's not as systematic as it as it could be. Of course, I mean it's, it's uh, the entitlement theory itself, right? Um, the idea that you know. Distributive justice is largely a historical matter, right? It's, it's a matter of whether you got the holdings that you have in the right way, not do your holdings sort of uh, combined with the holdings of other people fall into a certain kind of pattern. Um, that, there's something right about that view, I think, but it's, it's very sketchily fleshed out by Nozick, right? I mean, he says, um, you know, to, to articulate a theory of justice and holdings, we'd need a theory of just acquisition, a theory of justice and transfer, and a theory of justice and rectification, you know, what to do when unjust things happen. Yeah, it doesn't say anything about that last issue, right? Like what to do about the fact that most property rights as they exist today are the product in some sense of historical injustice. Blank stare. Um, and he says very little about the principle of justice and transfer either. Um, he says a fair bit about justice acquisitions, uh, but even there there's a lot of questions left unanswered. Right? Uh, he sort of gives these parenthetical remarks like why is it that mixing our labor um, with an object because it's a property right in that object, right? Well, why don't I just lose my labor when I mix it into the object? It doesn't answer that question. Um, so it's, it's a great theory. It's a good start, um, but it's, it's certainly not the last word in libertarianism. There's a lot more work to be done by libertarian political philosophers, which is good job security for me, I guess. OK, our next question. Doesn't incorporating the idea of non-governmental power, although it is real, violate the idea behind Lord, Acton, Lord Acton's dictum, liberty is the highest political end, implying that there are other important ends just not on the political sphere? Um, I'm not sure that it violates Lord Acton's dictum. Um, I, so for instance, I mean, you could hold that liberty is the highest political end, right? And, and nevertheless hold that there are other ends that are non-political that are higher to liberty, right? Like, so, so why is it that we care about liberty as a political end, right? I mean, because it fosters personal autonomy or because it allows us to live good lives. Um, you know, if, if you think there's some answer to that question, right, why, why do we care about liberty, then, if, then suggest that liberty has a kind of instrumental value, right? That it's good because it gets you these other things. Um, but you could, you could hold that view and still hold that politically liberty ought to be the highest end, right? So, so politically, our institutions ought to stop at the protection of individual liberty and not try to go further and promote these other ends, even though in some moral sense those ends might be higher. Um, why might you hold that view? A uh, complicated question. All right, but you might, for instance, hold that governments just aren't very good at promoting these other ends, uh, or that promoting these other ends would constitute a sort of unjust interference with individuals' private sphere. Um, but uh, but it's a consistent view. Uh, I, I think you know holding that um, opposition to non-governmental power is an important part of libertarianism doesn't necessarily commit you to violating Lord Acton's view, right? I mean, you could, you could hold that institutionalized racism and sexism, for instance, are a bad thing and that they ought to be combated, but that they ought not be combated by political means for one reason or another, right? Um, so, um, so you can still draw a distinction between what is the proper role of politics and what is the proper role of non-political action, even if you think that part of what it is to be a libertarian is to take on certain views um, that go further than merely specifying what the proper role of government is. 
Okay, looks like we'll have time for just one more question. Um, if you'll entertain for a moment the argument that healthcare doesn't adhere to the rules of free market. Uh, for example, consumption isn't always voluntary, patients don't behave as rational consumers, services don't lend themselves to cost comparisons, et cetera. What is a libertarian approach to reforming the US healthcare system? And as a bleeding heart libertarian, how does one reconcile the inherent ethical conflict of profit-driven healthcare? <laughs> you say I only have time for one more question, and then you give me that one, huh? Uh, how should I change healthcare policy? Oh gosh, um, I don't know. I think uh, it, uh, I guess I deny the claim made at the tail end of that um, that question that there's a conflict between uh, being driven by profit and uh, I forget I forget what the conflict was supposed to be with uh, between sort of providing healthcare and being driven by profit. Uh, I'm, I'm not sh sure that I see those things as as incompatible. Uh, I mean, people people do a lot of, of good things sort of motivated by the profit uh, motive. I don't see much of a, uh, a problem with, with using that motive to, to bring out you know, actions, that, to bring forth the kind of incentivized actions that we have independent reason to regard as morally virtuous. Um, OK, so how would I change the, uh, the US healthcare system? Uh, really, I mean, I don't know. It's, uh, I'm not sure that I think that uh, that I would agree that um, that healthcare uh, sort of isn't subject to the kind of normal economic principles that other market goods uh, are. Um, if, but you know, the question asked me to assume that that was true. If it were really true, I mean, I guess I would be open to considering um, you know various forms of government involvement in the healthcare industry to sort of overcome market failures. I mean, I'm. I identify myself as a classical liberal, and, and what that means for me is that I think, um, in principle anyways, there's a possible role for the state beyond um, sort of the mere protection of negative individual rights. Um, you know, I think, uh, would, would I be opposed to the government's uh, construction of an interstate highway system in the middle of the 20th century? Um, not necessarily, right? I mean, you can give kind of good economic public goods arguments for, for why that was a good uh, move. Um, could you give the same kind of arguments for government involvement in the healthcare system? I'm not sure. I just don't know enough about the subject to answer that question. If you could, I guess I'd be open to it, but I'm also very sensitive to the kind of public choice considerations uh, that suggest that right, even if we have a good theoretical reason to want government to be somewhat involved in the healthcare system, there's a tendency in real world politics for the actual institutions we create to far overstep uh, those bounds. So I, mean, I think that's a, that's a concern that anyone bleeding hard or otherwise would have to take seriously. Um, but again, um, it, it's a massively complicated issue. We don't have anything in, like the free market in healthcare right now. Um, so it's hard to say what a free market would look like. Um, and um, I'm not sure not only what it would look like, but I have no idea how to get from, from here to there. So uh, sorry. OK, well, thank you so much, Professor Zolinski, and to all of our participants this evening. We had a ton of questions. I hope you can all continue coming back to our webinars to learn more throughout the year. Our next webinar is Wednesday, November 30th at 8 PM Eastern Time. Daniel D'Amico will be discussing comparative political economy when anarchism is on the table. To register, visit our website, studentsforliberty.org. On a final note, shortly you'll be emailed a follow-up email where you'll find more detailed information about SFL and our next webinar. You'll also receive a survey to evaluate the webinar. Please take a couple of minutes to fill it out. It helps us to know how to improve our programs and makes these webinars more interesting for you. And with that, I think we're officially wrapped up. Thank you once again, and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you.